Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're going to take an in-depth look at the Grand Cathay faction review for Total War Warhammer 3. Now, it's no secret that Grand Cathay is Warhammer Universe's representation of China, so it only makes sense that I share my two cents on the topic. Now, from the reveal trailer, we first catch a glimpse of the city of Nangao before the Chaos Invasion, and if it reminds you of Avatar with the floating pillars and flying creatures, then you are correct, as both take inspiration from a real-world place in China called Zhangjiajie. Of course, the law of gravity forbids floating rock pillars in real life, but on a nice cloudy day, Zhangjiajie's unique rock formations do give off the appearance of floating pillars in the sky. Over this natural beauty, classical elements of Chinese architecture litter the entire scene. From the different styles of traditional Chinese rooftops to the use of the green tiles and red brick motif, the scene feels uniquely Chinese. Now, of course, there are some artistic deviations as there are a bit too much white used for the walls. The dragon roof decoration should run alongside the main roof beam instead of perpendicular to it, and the dome peaks used for the roof and railing are almost never seen in classical Chinese architecture. But disregarding these minor complaints, the artwork for Nangao, which is supposed to be this frontier city sitting on the western edge of the Great Bastion, or the Warhammer Universe version of the Great Wall, promises even grander scenes for future showings of the capital city of Weijing. Now, since this is a Total War game, let's move beyond looking at the colors of roof tiles and look at some of the units, because there is a bevy of units showcased in this trailer. And looking at their armor, it's pretty clear that Grand Cafe takes their main inspiration from the Ming Dynasty. We know this because the overlapping arm guards used here were only used in the Ming Dynasty. Historically, they consisted of 13 pieces of overlapping steel plates that ran the entire length of the arm, whereas the in-game form breaks them down to two pieces of four. The rest of the body armor and helmet resemble a very common style used by the Jin Dynasty cataphracts that were fabled to be untouchable on the battlefield. In contrast to the heavily armored infantries on the right, the units on the left looks unassuming, but they're actually wearing a cotton armor designed in the later periods of the Ming Dynasty in order to be more effective against firearms. While you might scoff at the notion of using cotton for armor, each of these armor packs over 4 kilos of cotton minimum, with some heavier winter variations that could go as high as 15 kilos of cotton per armor. And these little studs you see scattered across the armor, they're not for decoration. They're rivets designed to hold a thin lining of metal sheets inside the armor, in between the layers of cotton, in order to still retain some traditional defense against swords and spears. So given this information, it should come as no surprise that these units are hand cannon users. And speaking of hand cannons or cannons, in the very next scene we do get a short glimpse of this massive dragon-shaped cannon and the mighty terracotta statues before checking out a few more units on the march. Now, this scene here does have a very confusing looking commanding officer, who looks extremely Middle Eastern in style, from the headdress to the saber. But behind him, we see three distinct columns of infantry, ranging from peasant spearmen to heavily armored, what looks like Tang Dynasty palace guards, who are apparently strong enough to use a shield and a two-handed ji before finishing up with the same heavily armored infantry we saw earlier. Then in the next scene, we get an air show as herds of flying horse cavalry with reptilian wings join up with the Kongmingdeng squadron. Now these flying horses here don't really resemble any creature from Chinese mythology, as you will soon learn that a lot of mythical creatures in Chinese mythology can fly without wings. They fly magically, they don't need actual physical wings to fly. So not many Chinese traditional mythology creatures actually have wings. So these horses, they kind of resemble Kirin in terms of the scaly look, 
but the wings being reptilian doesn't really match. So we're just going to say this is an invention by the game. And the hot air balloon units, however, do utilize an invention created by none other than Zhuge Liang himself as Kong Mingdeng, the name of these paper uh, hot air balloons are named after Zhuge Liang's style name, which is Kong Ming, and Deng means lamp or light. And these paper balloons were invented during the Three Kingdoms period, and they functioned as flares for scouting purposes. Of course, in the Warhammer universe, they now serve as gun platforms for bolt action sniper rifle squads and some revolving cannons capable of seven shots, much like their land variations as seen earlier in the trailer. So clearly these war balloons and flying horses did not exist in history, but the firearm usage seen here was common practice during the Ming Dynasty. The standard Ming army consisted of 10% firearm units, 20% shield and saber units, 30% archers, and 40% spearmen. And they were the first to utilize cannons on ships for naval battle. So it does seem fitting that we get these cannons mounted on these war balloons replacing these naval feature. But perhaps the coolest unit featured in the battles are the Terracotta Sentinels, using move sets coming straight out of Three Kingdoms, and the Alchemists, or what I assume to be the Alchemists, utilizing the yin yang magic, resembling brush strokes with animation that seems to come straight out of Avatar. Looks like he's doing earth bending here. But both of these don't warrant any historical discussions, aside from the fact that there are over 8,000 human-sized terracotta warriors buried alongside the first emperor of China today. So instead, we're going to talk about a very minute but very important motif that is repeated across almost all the units within the Cathay forces, from their armor to headbands. And this is the fabled Shan Wen Jia, or the mountain-shaped scale. And this is named for their resemblance to the Chinese character for mountain. Now I say this is a fabled armor because this style of armor only exists in ancient texts, drawings, and statues. No physical copy have ever been discovered in any sort of archaeological dig, but because of this, it has always been a fascinating topic among modern day armor makers who make historical replicas. And many people have tried to reconstruct this armor based on texts and drawings and statues, and there have been many successful attempts at this, which is my guess of where the game takes the inspiration from. And there's also a lot of historical debate whether this style of armor actually existed or we're simply misreading how they're being depicted in these artwork and statues. The main issue with this style of armor is it sounds too good to be true. They are basically mountain shaped scales that will fit together almost like a puzzle holding each other in place without any glue, nails, or leather strappings. And certain historians believe this pulley didn't exist, and they argue that the artistic depictions of the armors we see is simply chainmail, a very particular type of chainmail that involved seven rings of interconnection between each of the ring, which is a pattern shown here, that will give way to almost a triangular looking center that seems to be a similar shape to what you might find on some of the statues. This is a mystery that we'll never know until someone finds an actual uh, mountain scale male in some tomb somewhere, but it's still pretty nice to see it in a fantasy setting in the game like this. Now at the end, we can't talk about the Cathay review without talking about dragons. In the trailer, we caught a glimpse of Mel Ying's transformation at the end as she took a leap of faith before transforming into a storm dragon. Now, as one of the two starting legendary lords for Cathay, Mel Ying and her brother Zhao Ming are both offsprings of the Dragon Emperor and the Moon Empress, and they both possess the ability to transform to their dragon forms. And from the limited amount of screenshots we have, we know they're going to play into the yin yang theme with the black and white theme representing the duality of the world in Chinese philosophy, one of them being male, one of them being female, one of them representing light, one representing darkness, and so forth. 
But perhaps one of the most interesting conversations I've seen about these dragons, especially from the Chinese fans, is there's a debate about how long should a Chinese dragon be, because if you look at the end of the trailer here, Mel Ying's dragon is shown to be a more serpent-like form, like many modern-day Chinese depictions of dragons are. Whereas the in-game screenshot and the game engine representation, the dragon seems a bit shorter. With more robust limbs, which many Chinese fans feel is more akin to a Western representation of dragon, and this is not entirely wrong accusation, but I feel it is important to provide some accurate historical background in order to talk about this topic. So first off, the Chinese dragon is clearly a mythical creature created by the imaginations of the ancient Chinese civilization, dating back over six thousand years ago. Where we have the first physical or visual representation、uh, of a dragon that's known to be used in worship, and based on traditional texts, the dragon is a combination of nine different traits from nine real-world animals, and they are the antler of a deer, the head of a camel, the neck of a snake, the stomach or the belly of a mollusk, eyes of a shrimp. Scales of a koi fish, palms of a tiger, ears of a cow, and talons of an eagle, and this seems like a weird mix of nine animals, and indeed it is. But in the end, most drawings of Chinese dragons are based off of these descriptions. And you might note on number three, it says the neck of a snake. It does not say the entire body of a snake. So the body length and the shape of the dragon. Has varied quite a bit throughout Chinese history. Most modern-day Chinese associate dragons more closely to how it was depicted during the Qing Dynasty. But if we look all the way back, and we're going to jump back in history quite a bit, we can see the evolution of the visual depiction of dragon within the Chinese culture, and see how things have changed, and whether this shorter dragon. Fits along the theme, and I think it does. So if we go all the way back, the first known visual depiction of a dragon would exist in Poyang. It's a burial chamber, and it has a dragon shape made out of seashells in a mosaic pattern in a tomb. It dates back over six thousand years ago, and if we go a little bit more recent, we have a jade piece found in Hongshan. It's a jade dragon. Very abstract in this form. Then moving on to the first dynasties, Zhou Dynasty, before the Spring Autumn, we have a jade dragon piece here that has more details, dating back about three thousand years ago. Then in the early periods of the Han Dynasty, we have more of a beast-like dragon. You can see the two different Han Dynasty dragons here: one in the middle of the jade circlet. The other one being a bronze statue. These dragons tend to have a beast-formed body, neck of a snake, but the body more closely to a reasonable land creature with limbs and more robust features on the limbs. And this tradition continued all the way into the Tang Dynasty, as you see the Tang Dynasty dragon dating in the 700、uh, era. You have a walking dragon. There's also leaping dragons. There's different forms of gold dragons. We have a lot more artifact as we move towards modern day. But the big break in terms of how dragon is drawn and depicted came in the Song Dynasty, when the Song Dynasty reached into what's called Nan Song or the Southern Song,、uh, near you know 1100、uh, CE or AD. Um, we have drawings of dragons that are very serpent-like, and they're very long, and they're usually drawn in the clouds. And this tradition, departing away from the beast-like features from before this period, will continue into the Yuan Dynasty, as you see them on porcelain pieces, into the Ming Dynasty, and finally on the emperor's robe in the Qing Dynasty. And speaking of this robe, there's another thing that I see people. Argue about online, and that's about the number of talons on the dragon. So in the Qing Dynasty, there was this unwritten rule where the emperor 
talon had five fingers, right? He had five talons on the dragon. And only the emperor could have five talons. And this started in the Ming Dynasty and became more official in the Qing Dynasty, as you can see on this robe. But this is not always the case. And this wasn't even a set law. It was just kind of an unwritten practice. But there's plenty of instances of non-imperial uses of the dragon with five talons. But this doesn't mean if you don't have five talents, you're not a dragon. The most typical representation of the Chinese dragon is four talents, because one of the traits we talked about earlier is that they have talents of an eagle, which have four talents. So that part is the traditional method. If you look at some of the drawings from Song Dynasty, four talents and three talents were actually the most common. The five talent form really came in during the Ming and Qing dynasty. And they made all these rules where the princes can only have four talent dragons drawn the robes that they wear, and only the emperor himself can use the five talent version. And since this is depicted heavily in media in forms of soap operas and TV shows, most modern day Chinese associate these rules with the dragon. So it's no surprise that in game, these dragons have four talents, and some people are arguing that you know, this is not a real dragon. It has four talents. It's something called a mong, which is a type of snake or a mythical snake with limbs. But I don't think that's the case. I think using three, four, or five are all fine. I think the length is good. Um, they didn't go with the short body. It's kind of beast life. It's kind of half and half in game, in my opinion. And it's pretty decent. And I'm excited to see more. Now, the final note is today, they came out with the lore blog as well which I'll link in the description below. You can go check out the story background of Cafe provided by uh, Warhammer as well as, well, I guess, Game Workshop and Creative Assembly together. And it talks about how the siblings, there's more than two. We're only getting two as playable Lord, but there's gonna be more than two. Have fightings, you know, they're bicker and there's infighting as well. But more importantly, the cool thing that was left at the end of the lore blog is it talks about the Dragon Emperor disappearing for 400 years. And during this power vacuum, the Monkey King came out and fought his way to the Imperial Court, only to be banished when the Emperor returned. Calling towards the Journey to the West story, the early version where uh, Wukong goes to the Heavenly Court and fights his way into the court. So that's an interesting nod. We're not going to see the Monkey King as a playable faction early on, but he will be associated with Cathay. It says that after he was defeated, he ran south. And we're definitely going to see him because if anything, the Monkey King will make a great DLC that will make both of them a lot of money, uh, Game Workshop as well as Creative Assembly. So I'm eagerly looking forward to seeing that with a more diverse rosters of mythical creatures, perhaps with a bit of Buddhism influence once we do get to see the Monkey King. Maybe a southwestern approach closer to uh, the Warhammer universe version of India, which I think is just called Kingdom of Ind, and uh, we'll see what they do with that. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this review. I think they're going to be showcasing more news about the other playable lord and all the units in the future, similar to what they did with uh, the Kislov review early on uh, this year. So we'll be checking that out when that happens, and we'll see you guys then. Bye!